Folks, God is so good. I'm just telling you, we've had a fantastic uh, 2023, and uh, I just look forward to 2024. I believe God has some great things for us. And if we'll just stay in his word, uh, be in prayer, uh, keep our hearts and minds clean and pure and holy, uh, we will see his will done in the life of our church and in our personal lives also. And if you're a guest today, we are going through the book of Revelation. And uh, I know it's kind of hard just to jump into the middle of it, uh, but we have been in Revelation for quite some time now, and we are at the 15th chapter. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Revelation chapter 15. Today I want to talk to you about the subject of the wrath of God. The wrath of God. And I understand it sounds negative, but you have to understand what true justice is. Okay? God is a God of justice and truth. And when man sinned, and that was a choice, folks. And when we sin, it, it is a choice. And what we have to realize is God would not be God if there was no wrath or no penalty for our sin. And we, we sometimes take that in a negative con, you know, uh, frame of mind. But here's the deal that you need to understand. If you are under conviction of the Holy Spirit, that is one of the true signs that you are saved. Because the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. So instead, instead of just looking at one side of things, and you can see all through the Bible uh, where after the fall, God had to discipline his children because they have made wrong decisions, and truthfully, they followed the world. Folks, the world is enticing us. Uh, even in the time that we were off, I watched more TV than I normally do. And I'm just telling you, folks, Satan is at work in our airways. Some of the names of the titles of programs. I sure hope, and I've never seen this. I, and again, I hope you're not watching something called evil. Okay? I mean, that just that makes no sense to a Christian. All right, and, and we need to understand that Satan is not taking us with him. So the next best thing is, number one, to make your life miserable. Number two, to make you uh, look not Christian-like. And so in our text, and we're past the interlude. This interlude was chapter 12, uh, 13, and 14. We are opening up to the, the rest of Revelation. And if you have a bulletin and you want to follow along with us, number one, God's wrath will be finished. God's wrath will be finished. We talked about the first three and a half years of tribulation. And these, and now we have gone past that and we are talking about the last part of the tribulation. And I will say this, things get worse and worse and worse and, and these judgments get more harsh. Number two, the nations will worship God. All right, not everyone that is left here. I told you I believe in the rapture of the church. I believe that any day now, Jesus could look at God and God say, hey, go get my bride. I don't know about you, but even when Amy was singing the, that song about holiness, folks, I don't think in our true minds we understand how holy God is. He's never sinned. He's never thought an evil thought. He's never had bad actions. He is God Almighty. He is holy, holy, holy. And folks, even during these times of tribulation, there will be Christians, and a lot of them are going to be martyrs, folks. They are going to be, they are going to be killed because they are Christians. But there are still, I am telling you, people that will worship uh, Jehovah God, and we'll see that in our Scripture. And number three, the power, God's power is, will de be displayed. Hey, let me give you a little hint here. God wins, folks. You can't buck God. You can't go up against God. I know the Antichrist is going to try to do that. All right? I know the beast and all that's going on, the false prophet, they are going to act like they have taken over the world. But I got news for you, folks. God is in control of everything. He decides when you live. He decides... He knows your date already of, the, of your death. 
And my prayer right now is just, again, and I'm certainly not afraid to die, but my prayer is that we'll all get to go together in the rapture of the church. In chapters 15 and 16 of Revelation, it presents the final outpouring of God's wrath before Christ's return to earth. You have to remember, this is the third woe, the third woe that we picked up, spoke of. The first one were the seven seals. The second one was the seven trumpets. And now we will look at the seven bowls. The, uh, that wrath is expressed by the effects of the seventh trumpet, which are the seven bowl judgments found in Revelation 16. So we are one week away from opening the bowl judgments. Chapter 15 of Revelation is the shortest chapter in Revelation, which only has eight verses. Throughout human history, God has poured out his wrath on mankind, beginning with the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden. From Genesis to Revelation, God warned a sinful, wor sinful world of his wrath and judgment coming to mankind. From Noah to the day of the Lord, there has been sowing and reaping consequences uh, of man being a sinner and ignoring God's invitation to turn to the Lord and be saved. Thankfully, even during the time of the Great Tribulation, people can and will be saved from the wrath of God and survive to enter the millennial kingdom of God. So let's look at chapter 15, wonderful scripture in God's holy word. The wrath will be finished. Then I, we are talking about John, saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. And when you see another sign, this is the third sign that he sees. The first sign, and they are both found in Revelation chapter 12, is the woman. And the woman represents Israel. And the other sign in chapter 12 is the dragon. And the dragon uh, represents Satan. And folks, I am telling you, Satan is against Israel. Folks, we as Christians need to stand with Israel. God's power and God's reign, Israel and the Jews are God's chosen people. And even though I am not of that heritage, folks, I am a child of God. And God will use uh, the revelation time and the scripture and revelation and these tribulation times to turn the hearts of Israel back to him. And it's not just those folks that are going to get saved. There'll be many of all nations saved, and we praise God for that. So we see this third sign. And again, when you see the word sign, in the New Testament alone, it is used 77 times. A sign is something that is to come. This is a prophetic book. These are things that are going to happen. And I'm telling you, folks, I believe the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And I believe what it says here, there will be a sign. And notice the, the description, great and marvelous. Great is big things, okay? Big things, they will blow you away. Marvelous is amazing. It's like, wow, wow. And it says, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And we have told you the judgments, the last three, the last woe is the third judgment, which are the bowl judgments. In, verse, in chapter 16, we'll see this. And they will be poured out in the world for everyone to see. Everyone will be a part of that. And folks, there is going to be death like you've never seen before. And again, I'm not trying to scare anybody at all. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says, and we'll see that in the rest of Revelation. And this is because the end of history in mankind is almost here. The world as we know it, and you have to understand, when the bold judgments finish up, we will go straight into the millennial kingdom that thousand-year reign of Christ. So everything is going to change, and this part of God judging the man will be the harshest we have seen in history. And God's final wrath is about to happen, 
And here's the deal. Why would he do this? Because he had given these tribulations. He had given them the seal judgments. He has given mankind the trumpet judgments, but there are still people that will shake their fist in the face of God. So he's not trying to be mean about what he's doing. He's extending this time in this point in the bold judgments, trying to get their attention. He wants more people to be saved. He wants to give more people an opportunity to be saved. It's not a thing that God hates man. He loves man. He sent Jesus to die for mankind, but he hates sin, and sin has corrupted our world. Folks, it's everywhere. Sin and corruption is everywhere. I want you to see this prophecy in Zephaniah. Look in the back of the Old Testament. I know you don't turn there much because I had to look it up myself. All right? Look in Zephaniah. Chapter 1, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 2. And you know the title there is the great day of the Lord. Okay, and this is this period that we are talking about. I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast, and I will consume the birds uh, of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. So the prophet here is telling God's people in those days, you have to realize uh, they were destroyed. You know, uh, they, they went into Babylonian captivity. Jerusalem was destroyed. And here, towards the end, that is exactly what is going to happen. Now look in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted. Now, folks, this sounds exactly like our world today. To the oppressed city, she has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her. Can I remind you earlier in the book of uh, you know, Genesis, uh, so- Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, the sin of homosexuality was rampant. You know, it it was just like a sexual God was taking over this city. And God told them, hey, you need to get out of that city. It is wicked, and I'm going to destroy it. It's like after the flood, if you even look before that, all right? He says in Genesis, I regret that I even made mankind. They were so wicked at that time. So we should not be surprised seeing the history in the Bible and reading the prophecy of these prophets of God. And you have to realize these were written centuries before Jesus even came to earth. So we're not reading anything new. What we see is what our world has become. Look at verse 3. And her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judge are evening wolves that leave not a bone until morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Folks, we see that everywhere. You can be shot for looking at somebody funny. And it's just crazy. There's this lawlessness that we are living in in these days. The Lord is righteous in her midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning he brings justice to light. He never fails. Folks, no matter how bad things get, God is with us. The Bible says God will never leave us and will never forsake us. I have cut off the nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I have made the streets desolate with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There is no not one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me and you will receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off, despite everything for which I punished her, but they rose earlier and corrupted their deeds. Folks, when is mankind going to understand? God hates sin. And if we die, if if folks die without Christ, they spend an eternity in hell. 
Folks, I, I, you know, it, it doesn't make me feel better because of that. It breaks my heart that people will not recognize and, and see who God is. God is up in heaven, and he wants what's best for you. But he will not make you be saved. He gives you the opportunity of choice. And folks, there's a lot of people that have not chosen Jesus Christ. Verse 8, therefore wait for me, says the Lord, the day I rise up for plunder, my determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be destroyed with the fire of my jealousy. Folks, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And we as Christians should not fear that. We should not fear judgment. We should not fear death, folks. But God as we will see in chapter 16, is going to basically destroy the earth and is on the way towards the battle of Armageddon, folks. And then we go into the millennial kingdom. So God's wrath will be finished. Number two, the nations will worship God. Look at verse two. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number in his name, standing on the sea of glass, having parts of God. And John sees in this vision something like the sea, and he is taking to heaven. He is taking to heaven because the sea of glass has been mentioned already. And the question is, what is the fire? And when you look at fire, uh, it could be one of two things, okay? One, it can be the fire of judgment that will come on mankind. But I believe the fire represents what the tribulation saints if, that will go through. Okay, right now, we can go, we can carry our Bible, we can worship God. I can go down, uh, you know, on Towson. I can get on a corner with my Bible and I can preach the Word of God. And as long as I don't make a disturbance, all right, I can stay there. But yet, folks, during this time, when the Antichrist gets a hold of things, when he's already, and we've read what is going to happen, folks, I'm telling you, he's going to build an image, and he is going to say, you either uh, bow down to this image, or we are going to kill you. If you want to eat, you have to take the mark of the beast. And I'm telling you, that's where true tribulation is. And persecution is. And folks, I do not, I am not kidding when I say this. If somebody asked me this very day to curse God or, or anything to deny my God, folks, I really don't care what they do to me. Because what they're doing, I just almost want to laugh at them, to be honest with you. You say, Mike, you need counseling. You need something, all right? But here's what I'm going to say. Pull the trigger. I will be in the presence of God in less than a second. Folks, we should not fear death. In this time, he's trying to say that, folks, those who, those who are, are left here and go through the tribulation, for them to stand for Christ is probably going to cost them their life. Okay? So we have the fires of judgment, the fires of judgment, the things the tribulation states went through. And the other fire uh, there is talking about the Holy Spirit and, and the Holy Spirit's power. Folks, I am telling you, we should have no fear because God is with us all, at all times, at all times. And then it says, and those who have the victory over the beast, and we know the beast is the Antichrist, in his image, it will be, it will be seen, all right? It will be a huge statue over his mark and over the number in his name, and we know the name, or the mark is uh, the mark of the beast, and the number is 666. Now here is the good part. Look at verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, and the servant of God, and the songs of the Lamb. Those who are in heaven. John saw this. John saw what was going on on earth but something different 
is going on in heaven. Steve, I'm telling you, you guys know how, your praise team, y'all know how to uh, do a song service. You, you help us worship God. But folks, in heaven, it will be perfect pitch, perfect worship. No sin, no attitudes, just praising God. And he mentions two different verses to this song. The first verse in chapter, uh, or in verse 3, is a song of deliverance. A song of deliverance. And chapter 4 is a different song. It's a song of salvation. And the song of Moses has to do with, deal with the Old Testament. Okay? And the, the, the New Testament is the sound of the song of the Lamb. So we see these two different songs, and I believe they are talking about the Christian martyrs here, and they will be leading, I believe, these songs. And look at this. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Hold your finger there and go back with me to Exodus, Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15. And this is the song of Moses. This is the Old Testament song. Then Moses, and you, you know this is after they crossed the Red Sea, and they, they were delivered. Even the children of Israel, as they were going, they saw the water high, high above their heads. And they saw Pharaoh and his armies coming behind, and they really thought they were going to die. But God had a plan for them. And we know that they crossed uh, the Red Sea on dry land. And when the last person got where dry land would be, the water fell and destroyed all of Pharaoh and his uh, soldiers. Then Moses, the children of Israel, sang the song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed uh, gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. Folks, we should praise God every day of our lives. We have something to praise God for. My Father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he is cast into the sea. Cho his chosen captains also drown in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them, and they have sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. And folks, to really truly believe this and, and see how what an impact it made on these folks was, would be to be there. If your life was in danger, if you saw them coming after you, if you knew that they were coming to kill you, if you got on the other side and you saw what took place there, uh, you would sing that song. You would rejoice and you would praise our God. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. And you send forth your wrath, and it consumed them like a stubble, and with the blast of your nostrils, the waters gathered together. The flood stood upright like a heap. The depths uh, congealed the, in, the, in the heart of the sea. And the enemy said, I will pursue, I will take, overtake, I will divide the spool. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword, my hand, and destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, and they sank like a lead. All folks are... God is watching over us. We are under the divine protection of God. And we need to understand that's what this part is. That is what the singing of this song is. Verse 11, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, O glorious holiness, fear and praising and doing wonders? You stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. You in mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them with your strength and, and to your holy habitation. The song that I think of, Brother Steve, How Great Thou Art. 
Folks, I love the hymns, and man, I'm all for, you know, I love the song Jesus in the Mount Jesus, you know, to speak, you know, the name of Jesus. I love it. But folks, there are a lot of folks that will not sing these old hymns of praise. If you look in the old Baptist hymn book, you will see every one of those hymns are based in Scripture. And folks, our God is great. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And we need to sing to him. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow would take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab trembling and will take hold of them. And all the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. And that's exactly what happened in the Old Testament, folks. They went into the promised land. They defeated uh, the enemy at Jericho, and God was on their side. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as a stone. Till your people pass over, our Lord, to the people that pass over whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made, for your own dwelling, the sanctuary of the Lord, which your hands have established. Folks, I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to get to heaven. The song, when we all get to heaven, what a glorious day it will be. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. And then we see, the song, verse 4, and this is of uh, salvation. Who shall not fear you, O Lord? For you alone are holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before you, and for your judgments have been manifested. And I want you to see a little contrast between these two songs. The song of Moses was sung at the Red Sea. The song of the Lamb will be sung by the Crystal Sea. The song of Moses was a sign of triumph over Egypt. The song of the Lamb is triumph over Babylon. The song of Moses was first uh, sang in Scripture. The song of the Lamb will be the last song uh, sang in Scripture. Both songs commemorate the execution of a foe, the expectation of the saints, and the exaltation of our Lord and Savior. Folks, there's a reason we sing in church. We need, folks, uh, even in our own lives, we need Christian music to just dwell in us. We need to listen to Christian music. We need to sing Christian music. We need God's words in the Christian music in our lives because I am telling you, folks, we are going to spend all of eternity singing praises to God. So we see God's wrath. We be finished. We see the nations will worship God. And the last song, uh, the last one is God's power would be displayed. Look at, look at verse 5. And after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And again, when we think about the temple, uh, folks, that's what heaven is about. Heaven is the temple. It's not a place. You know, I mean, the whole thing is a place of worship. It's not a literal temple. Heaven is the tabernacle of God and the testimony of heaven. And the part that he is speaking of is that holy of holies. And you remember, as we have read before in the holy of holies, and we've studied the Old Testament, you know, that that is where the presence of God is. I really believe with all my heart, when you first get into heaven, you're not going to have to say a word. Because I've heard people even say, you know, you know, what are you going to tell God? Well, what do you tell a God that knows everything? That's the first question I have. What are you going to try to impress him with? You can memorize the Bible, and some people have. But God say, I'm not impressed. I wrote the book. Folks, just being in the presence of God. Here's the deal, folks. We have nothing on earth that even remotely resembles heaven. Nothing. Because we associate with beautiful things. 
You know, heaven is like, I heard a man say one time, it's like when you get off a ski lift and there's been no, you know, nobody on that lift and there's snow everywhere and you just go down in this peaceful snow and I said, eh, wrong. <laughs> heaven is like a sunset in the Bahamas, you know, you're laying on a beach and you watch the sun go down. Well, that is nice. And if y'all want to send me there, I'll go. But it's not heaven, folks. Heaven is where the presence of God is. No more sin, no more pain, no more sorrow. Verse 6, And out of the temple came seven angels, having seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. And again, these seven angels are ones that we have spoken of before, and they are the seven angels that will uh, pour the seven bowls out on mankind. And when you look at their dress and what they have on, uh, these would be what I call heavenly garments. Uh, some people relate them to priestly garments, and there are some uh, similarities in this. But, you know, without all the ephod, without all the other things, the description, I think this is more about what we all probably will wear. And we know the gold uh, 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 represents purity. And look at verse 7. Uh, then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And we know there are high-ranking high angels. Uh, Michael is a, a high-ranking angel. Gabriel is a messenger. Uh, in the Old Testament, the cherubim is mentioned. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel, and the seraphim is mentioned in Isaiah, but these are special angels set aside for special uh, deliveries and special things that God has for them, and they are going to uh, pour out these these the these wrath the, the wrath of God in these bowls. And now look at verse eight, and the and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. Oh, folks, think of that. Smoke. And again, not the smoke that we think of. All right? The cloud. The cloud. The, the presence of God. And we need that. Uh, because even now, if we went into the presence of God like we are, we could not survive that. And, and we have Old Testament examples of that with Moses. And it says, and from his power, and no one was to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were complete. So this starts. This is a, a, a preview of the seven bows that we will study uh, next week. God will put an end to sin once and for all. Folks, I can't wait to live in a sin-free environment. Isaiah chapter 6, go with me if you would. And I close with this. Isaiah chapter 6. Again, I like to pick up the Old Testament. Isaiah verse 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above, and above it stood a seraphim. There's the angels. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. Two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one cried to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And folks, we as Christians need to have a reverential fear of God. That is not being afraid of God, but that is respecting God, respecting God's house, respecting God's word. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. 
Your iniquity, iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. He's talking about salvation, folks. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, tell this people. Folks, this is a message to the church. This is a message to Christians. And in 2024, this is what we should be doing. And it says, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. There are still people, lost people around us. Some of it are family members. Some of, some of them are neighbors. Some of them are work associates. Some of them are people that we hang around that don't know Jesus Christ. Christ as Lord, Lord and Savior. And he says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And my prayer today is you will make this statement. Here I am. Send me and go and tell this people. I was laying in bed last night praying my last prayer of the night. And God just put this in my head. Can you imagine what would happen? If everyone sitting in this sanctuary led one person to Christ in 2024, every one of us led one. You know what we'd have to do? Have two services. And again, I, I'm not saying that's what I want to do. I want to do what the Lord wants to do. But I know what the Lord wants to do. The Lord wants us to go and to sin and to say, and to share the gospel of Christ to a lost world. Folks, time is of the essence. If we're going to do anything for Christ, I would do it in 2024. Father, thank you for this day, and God, I thank you for this revelation, God, that you give us. And God, I thank you that one day we are going to be in a perfect place, a perfect environment, and God, I'm just so excited about heaven. I really am. And God, I pray as we look at 2024 that we would be people of praise. I pray that we would be people of worship. God, I pray that even in music choices, God, there's so much Christian music out there. I pray that we would flood our minds and our homes and our cars with Christian music. God, I pray that we would all look for one person. We've got 300, over 300 days left, much over 300, to share the gospel with someone. And God, I pray, Lord, that it would be so in our lives. God, we're, we're going. We know we are going if we're saved. But God, there are many, many people that cannot say that with the assurance of heart. So, God, I pray that you move in our hearts. I pray the Holy Spirit would convict us. And I pray that we would win one person to the Lord Jesus Christ in 2024. God, we love you. We praise you. This is your church. This is your invitation. We need to rededicate our lives or come for baptism or even join the church. God, I pray that you would, through the Holy Spirit, help us to step out in the out of our chair to, to walk down the aisle and use these prayer altars or just pray with one of us. God, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?